Welcome to The Real News. I'm Jessel Noor in Baltimore. Good evening. There's no harder lesson than the one taught today to aid Atlanta educators by an angry judge after they were convicted on charges typically reserved for mobsters. Their crime was a conspiracy to fake test scores to make themselves and their schools look successful. And I think it's fair to call it a true mess is about the children. And these are the most vulnerable children in the state of Georgia. And it truly is heartbreaking when you consider that these children were robbed of an education. Eight black educators convicted in one of the most high profile court cases dealing with alleged cheating on standardized tests. Their crime, conspiring to change their students' answers. The case was sensationalized by the media. First, they were convicted in the court of public opinion and then sentenced to lengthy prison terms. While a new book offers an insider's account of the trial and casts doubt on the entire narrative put forth by prosecutors and often echoed by the press. It offers badly needed contextualization of social and economic policies that concentrated racialized poverty in inner cities. It also examines the role of the so-called education reform movement, backed by powerful corporate and real estate interests, played in creating the conditions where the cheating scandal unfolded. The book is called None of the Above, The Untold Story of the Atlanta Public Schools Cheating Scandal, Corporate Greed, and the Criminalization of Educators by Shania Robinson and Anna Simonton, who are both joining us in studio. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, Shani Robbins is an, is an alumni of Tennessee State University, an advocate for troubled youth and their families. She taught in the Atlanta Public Schools for three years. She's one of the educators convicted in this scandal and is appealing her conviction. Anna Simonton is an educator for Scalawag Magazine, co-founder of Press On, a new media collective dedicated to strengthening and expanding movement journalism in the South. And she's a graduate of Atlanta Public Schools. So. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you both uh, joining us in the studio today. So let's start off by why you decided to write this book. I mean, you, you're currently appealing your case. Are you sort of putting yourself at risk by, you know, this book is a devastating account and you you go after this whole system that that uh, that set up this process and, you know, you you don't hold back, it seems, on, on anything. Absolutely. And, you know, I may be putting myself at risk, um, but telling the story, telling the truth, is so much more important to me. And I actually wrote this book for my son, Amari. I was pregnant with him during the entire eight month trial. It was the longest criminal trial in Georgia history. And so it actually started off as a journal that I was writing to him because I knew that once he got older, he was gonna have some questions. And so as I began writing and kind of connecting the dots and putting the pieces together, I said, you know, this book is bigger than me. Um, this is really about the intentional destruction of public education in this country. And so once I realized that I wanted to take the book to the next level, I teamed up with Anna. Um, and it's been an amazing journey with her as we, you know, pull back the layers because the phrase cheating the children was used so many times during our trial in regards to me and my co-defendants. And so in the book, we're asking the question, who should really be held accountable for cheating these children because they have been harmed in so many different ways. Their communities have been under attack for decades. They are privatizing their schools and now they're criminalizing their educators. Nana, um, so you're a journalist. Talk about how you got involved. I know a lot of this book deals with media critique as well. So uh, did, you, did you add your perspective there as well? Yeah, um, this was near to my heart, um, not only because I came up through Atlanta Public Schools, but because my middle school counselor was actually convicted in this case mm. as well. Um, and so I was a freelance journalist working in Atlanta, um, covering some education issues, but I didn't cover the trial. Um, it was sort of in and out of um, the public dialogue because it dragged on for so long. And the moment when people really sat up and paid attention, including myself, was when the convictions were handed down and these harsh sentences were meted out. And I just felt devastated to see um, all black educators, my middle school counselor, um, facing the sentence for tests that, you know, I had to take when I was a student that I felt um, had very little to do with whether or not um, we were actually being educated. Um, and so it was just an honor when Shawnee reached out to me because it gave me an opportunity to try to do something about a really um, messed up situation. 
And so you start the book off by talking about, starting with Teach for America, and you're an alumni with Teach for America. I am. And so um, you start you start there, and that's sort of a path to sort of get into the corporate education reform movement, the neoliberal education. There's a lot of names for it, but um, it's you know backed by powerful interests, backed by corporate interests um, that that want to shape education. And with Teach for America, you're putting uh, teachers in into classrooms that you know, have very little training, a few months of training, and you're putting them in the mo in the, the classrooms that have the highest need. Right. Um, so talk about your, start there and how that sort of, uh, unra how that unravels this bigger picture. Well, you know, my mother was actually a second generation school teacher. Um, and I can remember helping her tutor some students when I was younger. So the passion of teaching has always been there, but I didn't major in teaching. I didn't major in elementary mm -hmm. education. And so when a friend of mine called and told me about Teach for America, where I would train for five weeks and be able to put in a classroom, um, you know, the thought was appealing that I could do that. Um, and and at the time, I remember feeling like I was aligned with what they believed in, that any child can learn and succeed. Um, but, you know, there's a lot more that goes into that. And I think after my experience working in Atlanta Public Schools, um, it really, I, I guess, broadened my horizons as to um, what all goes into making sure that a child is successful um, or gets a good education. And so I really feel like, Teach for America as an organization was kind of co-opted by the corporate education reform movement. Mm -hmm. um, but the people who join, you know, I think that we have very good intentions, but I don't think, um, you know, I was fresh out of college. I didn't really have a lot of knowledge about education or politics and things like that. Um, and so I, I have learned more about the role that it has played mm -hmm. um, within the corporate education reform movement. And Anna, this is just one of these uh, groups that has a disproportionate role on public education policy and debates. Um, uh, talk, talk more about um, Teach for America and sort of what it represents. Yeah, so Teach for America was founded by Wendy Kopp in the late 1980s, and she was um, an Ivy League graduate trying to kind of find her purpose in life, um, also had not met, majored in education. Um, but had this idea based on the idea of the Peace Corps that, you know, what if um, students coming out of these elite colleges could be trained up and put into classrooms? And it, the ideology there is, is problematic because it's sort of assuming that just because you have gone to a great school, um, even if you haven't been trained in education, uh, just by virtue of your, your class status, really, um, that you will be effective in educating uh, young children. And the, the children that, that end up being a part of that program, as you mentioned, are, are the kids with some of the highest needs because it's, um, it's low-income school districts where, uh, that are hurting for teachers and that start to accept these TFA recruits um, in the early 90s. And some of the first backers of Teach for America sort of tell you, uh, sort of hint at the, how um, powerful interests saw the program as uh, serving in, in their interests. Chemical corporations, auto co companies, um, petrochemicals, some of the biggest folks who are part of things like the Business Roundtable, ALEC, these organizations that really drive policy in the United States um, are throwing down hundreds of thousands of dollars in seed funding um, to get this thing off the ground. And so those are some of the interests that as TFA progresses throughout the years and starts to have um, more political power, um, we see those forces sort of shaping education policy more and more. And I wanted to ask you sort of about the personal toll this took on you. Mm -hmm. um, if, from this book, it seems like you were blessed with a very strong family and support group. But as you said, you were you know, pregnant through this whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, your son is now four. Um, you know, you sort of got engaged and married and all this was happening. You had family members fall ill and this whole, you know, while this all was happening, um, talk about what this was like and sort of getting dragged through the criminal justice system like this and, and what impact that had. Um, it was like living in a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Um, even when we were, when I found out that I had, had been indicted, my husband had actually called me, um, while I was carpooling with one of my coworkers and said, I... I just saw your name scroll across the bottom of the news screen. You've been charged with racketeering. So even just hearing the news, I was in a complete state of shock. And then when he said that I had been charged with racketeering, 
you know, I really didn't know what racketeering was, but I knew that it was a serious crime dealing with money. And so I actually never received any money. Mm -hmm. The racketeering charge was based on the fact that there were some educators who received bonus money mm -hmm. for their school meeting the district targets, which were like the benchmarks imposed by the Atlanta Public Schools Board and Administration. At my school, we've never met our targets. And I was a first grade teacher. My test scores did not even count. Um, so I was angry. I was angry that I had been falsely accused. Um, and just to take it back to how I was even dragged into this, in 2009, which was the year in question, I was a first grade teacher. And on the last day of testing for the CRCT, that's the standardized test that all first through eighth grade students had to take, the Criterion Referenced Competency Test. Mm. Um, there was a, um, an assistant teacher that came to my classroom and told me to meet the testing coordinator in the computer lab to erase doodles and stray marks off of my test booklets, off of my students' test booklets. And so this was actually something that was done every year. Um, so I didn't suspect anything. Because the stray marks might throw off this, the scanner, because you're talking about standardized tests and scantrons, you kind of. Right, and then I taught first graders who had to sit for long hours at a time. And so they did make little doodles and draw pictures and had stray marks. Um, and so I went to the computer lab. The testing coordinator handed me my test booklets and said to erase the stray marks and to fix any illegible handwriting in the student's demographic section. So I did all of that. I handed my test booklets back to the testing coordinator. And then I thought that was the end of the story until October of 2010, I got a phone call from a GBI agent. And by that time, I had already resigned from teaching. You know, as uh, a Teach for America recruit, we only commit to teaching two years. I actually stayed for three years. And so I started working for a counseling agency. And so the GBI agent um, told me there had been an erasure analysis done across the state and that in my class specifically, there were high levels of wrong to right erasures. And he said, can you explain this? And I said, no. He said, well, did the principal or did any administrators place any pressure on you to change your students' answers? And I said, no. And then he pulled out a pre-written voluntary statement form that was basically saying, you don't have any knowledge about cheating and you didn't cheat. And then he asked me to sign this form. I didn't know it at the time, but there were GBI agents that came into the schools and, and GBI teachers- is Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Okay. Teachers were pulled from their classrooms and they were interrogated. And like me, in many of those initial investigations, there were no attorneys present. Mm. And here we are signing a form, which later some educators were charged with false statements and writings for signing this form, which is a felony it's on top of the racketeering. Um, and so I was facing 25 years in prison. So yes, it was a nightmare.